Come on in. Welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about five super weird things Survivor used to do in its first few seasons that they don't do anymore. Nowadays, Survivor's a well-oiled machine, a slickly produced reality juggernaut with nary a dimple out of place. But just like me, early Survivor had some growing pains back in the early 2000s, as they were figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Now, I'm not going to be bagging on them for using VHS tapes from home or chatting with their families on AIM or anything like that, because that's just the tech of the times. Although, Keith, what are you doing? This is not how online shopping works. Rather, I'd like to look at some of the sillier and more bizarre relics of early Survivor that are long gone from the show now. From Jeff's desperate attempts to institute order via a prop at a season one tribal council, to production decisions that are so over the top, I can't believe they kept doing this all the way to season 11. What? All that said, let's take a look at five weird relics from early Survivor. At number five is Jeff's increasingly bonkers final vote deliveries. A hallmark of classic era Survivor, Jeff delivered the final Tribal Council votes in style in six of the first 11 seasons. The first elaborate final vote delivery occurred naturally in season two, where everything was meant to be bigger and better, especially the hats. Survivor Australia sought to one-up Borneo in every way possible, so for the first time, the final Tribal Council votes were read on a soundstage at CBS headquarters. Presented as if Jeff literally walked off stage at Final Tribal, flew the final Tribal votes from Australia, and just landed seconds before the finale, this is a fun if humble beginning for a final Tribal mainstay that would quickly go off the rails. How off the rails? The next time they did this, Probst would triumphantly tour New York from above before catching a cab to Central Park. They really capture New York in all its glory. The beautiful skyline, Lady Liberty, the cab driver leering at you. The absolute best moment is when Jeff literally asks for a receipt on live TV. Hey, receipt, Gotta expense that trip, y'all. Not unhinged enough for you? In Amazon, we are meant to believe that Jeff apparently jet skied all the way from Brazil to New York. Although this time he takes the subway to the finale. We stand a public transit king. And of course, Survivor Vanuatu has the wildest of all as Jeff goes full Tom Cruise, flying to LA, parachuting out of the plane, then riding a motorcycle to the live finale. Unfortunately, these epic final vote deliveries disappeared after Survivor Guatemala, because how do you top this? There's simply nowhere to go but down. Guatemala's vote delivery is itself a much more stripped down, back to basics version of the vote deliveries of seasons past, and the epic final vote delivery was quietly retired after this. Still, they're a fun reminder of just how extreme things were in the early 2000s. Like, this was meant to look cool. Get this man a skateboard and a surge. At number four are a series of quickly abandoned season one relics from Tribal Council. Anyone who's watched Survivor Borneo lately knows that it's delightfully rough around the edges, and includes a handful of half-baked ideas that are quickly abandoned next season, or even midway through this season. Perhaps the hokiest is the large chest of cash at Tribal Council, an ever-present reminder that this is a game for a million dollars, not just for fun. Surprisingly, the chest of cash makes it through the entire season, moving from its home next to Jeff to right next to the final two at the final Tribal Council. I wish this actually was the winnings, like you had to pack the cash and get it home yourself. You better hope Malaysia Air doesn't lose your luggage. Another season one and done is that the survivors would all bang a gong when walking into Tribal Council. This is another thing that made it completely through the first season, then was quietly retired. I guess they were announcing their presence to the island spirits, although there's a non-zero chance that this whole ritual started just because Sean saw a gong in the set decoration and just impulsively decided to bang it and everyone followed suit. 
Of course, the most hilarious retired relic of Survivor Borneo is the conch shell. Tribal Council was meant as a solemn and serious place, where the extinguishing of a flame was symbolic of death, an island sacrifice. So Probst was none too happy when, at Pagong's first tribal council in episode 2, they refused to take things seriously. This didn't make air, but the unruly Pagongs screwed around at tribal, Greg and Colleen openly mocked the show, and the tribe even voted out Jeff in their first vote. In an attempt to get the survivors to respect his authority, in Borneo's third tribal council in episode 3, there's a new rule. You may only speak when you're holding the conch shell. The Toggies all respect this rule, and the conch shell is politely passed as Jeff calls upon various players to answer his questions. But of course, this is not the tribe that Jeff needs help corralling. It all proves to be extremely pointless and completely disappears after episode 3, leaving Jeff alone to shape up his hosting skills and quick. The conch shell would have been an awesome relic for Survivor Ghost Island though, don't you think? I'm not sure what its magic power would be, like maybe give a player this conch shell at Tribal Council and they can't speak or something. But just imagine like Chris Noble or Angela or Jenna trying to stumble their way through the Advantage Exposition. This is the authentic conch shell from Season 1, Episode 3 that players had to hold to talk at Tribal Council an event which I, a huge fan of this show, definitely remember. Definitely. At number 3 are all of the DIY construction challenges, from creating SOS signals to building a tribe shelter. These do-it-yourself challenges, no probes necessary, first appeared in Episode 4 of Survivor Borneo, and winners are determined solely by an expert in the field of carpentry or, um, looking at beaches from above. This initial SOS challenge, which tasked the players with crafting the most eye-catching SOS signal on their beach, was likely created as both a budget-friendly challenge option as well as one that's thematically appropriate for Borneo's whole shipwrecked on the beach motif. It's a fun challenge that recurs for several more seasons, including in Africa, Marquesas, and Palau. Most memorably, Big Tom's hypnotic gyrations and Kim Johnson's pale buttocks from the Africa SOS have been burned into my retinas since 2001 despite my attempts to forget them entirely. The Marquesas edition is just bizarre. I mean, what are they wearing? Where are you going, Pappy? A rally in Charlottesville? In Survivor All-Stars, we get an all new type of DIY challenge, the shelter building challenge, judged by local contractor, Rafa. This guy says about two words the whole time he's on screen, choosing to let his hands do the talking instead. Rupert's ego getting absolutely destroyed as this guy points out how literally every aspect of his shelter is the opposite of what you should do is probably the best moment of this entire season. In Survivor Palau, we see both the SOS challenge and the shelter building challenge, and my unfounded yet probably accurate survivor conspiracy theory that I just made up just now is that these DIY challenges only popped up in Palau because the challenges as scheduled literally wouldn't work with Oolong's pathetic tribal numbers. So they had to improvise. These challenges largely disappeared after season 10, and you can see why. The more paranoid among us might accuse Survivor of cooking the books on which tribe wins, although I don't think that ever happened. Really though, these probably just disappeared because there's only so many ways you can see an SOS signal get built before it just kind of becomes the same thing over and over and over again. Wow, I wonder what they'll spell this time. At number two is Jeff sometimes not reading all of the relevant votes during a vote. In newer seasons, the votes are read by Jeff in an order intended to both maximize drama and show as many votes as possible, including showing all of the votes for everyone who doesn't go home, even random throwaway votes. This seems like a pretty obvious thing to do. More votes equals more suspense, but in early Survivor and as late as mid-period Survivor, they were regularly not showing every vote that mattered when Jeff actually reads the votes. Usually these votes went unread when it was a foregone conclusion as to who was going home. 
like when T-Bird's vote against Tom went unread at Survivor Africa's final five, or when Jim's vote for Margaret went unread in Survivor Guatemala's first tribal council. But stray votes not cast by the eliminated player also sometimes went unread at tribal, like when Shauna voted against Christy at the Joanna boot in Survivor Amazon. Now, this might sound nitpicky, but all of the relevant votes should be shown to both us and the players. I mean, not only is it just objectively better TV, but those lone votes matter. If a player eliminated unanimously wrote someone's name down, that should be public knowledge to the other players. This could blow back on the eliminated person's allies or paint a target on their target. If you cast a throwaway vote, you should have to atone for or cover for it after tribal. A stray vote from Teresa on Lex literally blew back on Kelly and got her voted out. These things matter. And I haven't even mentioned that the tiebreaker in season two was literally past votes. So Kimmy's vote on Jeff Varner when she went home, which went unread, kind of mattered a great deal at a deadlocked 5-5 tie at the merge between Colby and Jeff, when the tiebreaker is, again, literally the amount of previous votes you've had cast against you. When Probst asks Colby and Jeff how many past votes they each have at Australia's merge, Varner literally says, One that I know of. Um, you got two, buddy. Reading all relevant votes in the most dramatic way possible is one of the most sensible changes Survivor ever made, and an objectively good decision both from a game integrity and television product point of view. I mean, not reading all the votes? Talk about deception at Tribal Council. My favorite long gone relic of early Survivor is all of the intro shots used when Jeff did the cast rundown during the marooning. In Survivor's early seasons, during the marooning, Jeff would read to us, the audience, a breakdown of the tribes, including each player's name, occupation, and hometown. These were accompanied with a brief intro package, featuring a stage shot of X or Y player at their job or in their city, turning their head to face the camera. These little intro packages only existed through the fifth season, and you can see why they went away. They're lengthy, goofy, and sometimes the players couldn't even keep a straight face while filming them. Sorry, but I adore these. They are pure camp, and the cozy early aughts vibes are off the charts. In a way, though, the spirit of these intro packages has been reborn anew in Survivor 41 and 42, which reintroduced intro packages featuring home footage 19 years after their last appearance in Survivor Thailand. Updated for a new era, the intro packages are now sprinkled throughout the season, and in a post-pandemic world, focus less on the given Survivor's career or hometown, and more on who they are as a person and what they've been through in life. Whether that's surviving cancer, or losing a parent, or having to wear glasses. Wow, now that's trauma. And while I genuinely enjoy the new intro packages and hope they continue in future seasons, it's hard to top the sheer delight these old intros give me. At best, they're a genuinely good introduction to the character we're about to meet. So why not share a few of my favorites? There's Sonia, who's just sitting on a couch for some reason, Deb's chilling at jail, Keith's chopping vegetables out of the back of his car, Kelly's hanging poolside, Queen, crime reporter Tammy is reporting on crime, Zoe's way too steamy, Peter's way too serious for a guy in a bowling alley, and Penny's has more personality in two seconds than she showed in 10 episodes. Most alarming goes to this guy. Got nothing else for ya. You don't gotta pass a conch shell to see more, you just gotta like and subscribe, and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.